Hey there, Nick Jantakis here. In this video, we're going to go over using associative arrays with Bash. This could be really useful if you have key value pairs that you want to loop over, maybe to reduce duplication or just group a variable up into a common theme makes it a little bit easier to reason about. And by the way, to use associative arrays, you do need at least Bash 4, which by default, if you're using Mac OS, you may want to check your version. You can just run version like that. And then uh, I am running 5.1 here, but on Mac OS by default, it is going to be running uh, Bash 3.2, so you may want to brew install Bash to get a newer version. And by the way, Bash 4 has been around for a really long time, uh, since 2009. So this feature, in my opinion, is very safe to use. Basically, it's going to be available anywhere that you can run Bash. And uh, throughout this video, we're going to go over a couple of basic use cases, you know, defining the variables, setting things up, you know, deleting things, looping over things. And then we're going to go over a real world use case, which is basically the thing that prompted me to make this video. And I didn't prepare any of the code beforehand, did prepare some comments here because I just don't want to forget a couple of things to go over. But yeah, right now, you know, I can just run this demo script and it's not doing anything because we just have a couple of different comments here. So the first thing we need to do is define our associative array. And you can define a variable using dash A with bash, but since we're going to be doing an associative array, this needs to be capital A here. And then we can name the va variable whatever we want. And uh, the working example before we get to the real world example here, we're just going to mess around with some colors, right? Like red, green, blue. So now the first thing we'll want to do here is define some colors. So we can do red like this, uh, just call them by name for the key. And then for the value, let's go with the hex code here. So we can do FF0000, and that is the hex uh, code value for red. Then we'll do the same thing here for green. And then that one, we just need to shift the Fs over here. And if I can type, there we go. And then the last one, we will need to do blue. And then that one is going to end with FFs, and then we'll go zero, zero. There we go, cool. There, that's it. So you just have key values, right? We have the key that we want to define here and then the value for that one. And then uh, let's say that you want to look up a value by key, right? So let's say that we just want to, I don't know, get the color red, right? We can just echo that out. And we will want to use squiggly braces here because uh, I've done videos about this one in the past. Well, actually let's go without the squiggly braces first. Like what would happen if we were to just, you know, read it like this, right? Let's say that we want to get the key of red here we can just do this and then run it. What do you think is going to happen here? I'll give you a second if you want to pause the video. We are going to run it right now. Yeah, so it just literally like uh, echoes out bracket red. We can't do that. Uh, what we actually need to do here is use these squiggly braces here, which will allow us to, you know, access the key specifically, which is what we want here. And then that is going to return the value. You know, that video I've done in the past kind of goes into more detail about that one of why we need to use squigglies here. But yeah, you know, if we wanted to get you know, blue instead, we can just do blue there and we can see, there we go, blue, done, cool. So now let's uh, say that for whatever reason, you want to use a variable here instead of just a hard-coded string. So you can actually do this. So if we go and set up a new variable here, I don't know, this is gonna be a weirdly contrived example here, but you know, let's say that we create a variable called red and like the key that we actually want to have set here, like we're gonna end up accessing colors bracket R is set up like this. But uh, yeah, now what we could do is we can say colors and then we can do squiggly red here. Technically the squigglies aren't necessary in this case, but it's still good to use anyway. And then we can say, you know, I don't know, in, instead of using lowercase FFs, let's go capital here, just so we have something that's a little bit uh, distinguished from the other one. Uh, wait, hold on, that looks like it's too long. Yeah, one too many zeros, I think, yes. Um, but yeah, in, the, in this case here, right, we are defining a variable called red with a value of R. So this is going to create a new key called R, but it's using this as a variable. <laughs> it's a little bit confusing, uh, but let's uh, see what this looks like when we echo it out. So we can say colors like this, and then we can do uh, red, and then we can end the brackets and the squigglies and and the quote. And then if we run this, we should see the capital Fs there, right? Because we are now accessing this color by a variable, of red, which is really has a value of R. So, you know, just to make that a little bit more clear, uh, we can actually do an echo here and then colors and then R. And this was this will give us the same value or should here. Yeah, there we go. Same exact thing here. But in this case, we're referencing it by a variable instead of the hard coded value. I don't know. Um, let me know in the comments below when you may actually do that use case. You know, honestly, uh, for me, when I was doing most of my stuff here, working with associative arrays, this really doesn't come up, but I wanted to include it because you know, there probably is a use case out there when it's kind of nice to know about that. So let's say now that you just want to update an existing value, right? So let's say that we want to just update the value of green here, you know, whatever, instead of uh, the long form six character hex code, you know, let's break it up and just do the three uh, characters instead. So now if we do an echo on this one, we can do colors 
And then what do we want to do? We want to get the value of green. So now that we've updated it to be this, then we should see uh, the new format here with just the three characters there. So, you know, so far, this is pretty standard to working with any uh, associative array or dictionary or hash or, you know, things you may see in different languages, right? We've gone over how to set the values here, how to get a specific one, you know, even as a variable. And then also, if you want to update it, yeah, you just assign the key a new value and you're good to go. And then for deleting them, we can just use unset. So with unset, we can say we want to unset something like R. And in this case, you know, let's get rid of uh, that other, you know, variable one that we added there. And then we can also just confirm that. Let me copy this. Whoa, hold on. I'm going to do that. Well, what's going on? Life is getting hard. No? Okay, we're good. I don't know what happened there. My hands were on the wrong keys, and that's a very, very, very big situation if you're using Vim. Uh, yeah, uh, but let's say that we want to just echo out this R now. Like, this should now give us an empty output. Yeah, because why? Well, we deleted it, right? We just unset this specific key R, and then we try to access R, and well, it's empty, so we get nothing back. You know, it could be a little bit more clear if we use something like printf, where, you know, uh, echo is going to add the new line for us. That's why we see an empty there. But really, we're getting nothing back. But uh, yeah, it's pretty nice. You know, once in a while, you just may want to mutate this variable that you have here just by removing a key. So that's how you can do that. And then there's a, you know, multiple ways you can check things if exist. But, you know, I don't know, a pretty short one here is you can just do uh, dash V and then you can say, well, okay, cool. Let's actually really see if this thing has been, um, yeah, deleted or not. So we can do this and then just say something like echo, uh, I don't know, R exists, cool. And then let, let's keep ourselves honest here and just make sure the red one still exists. So, yeah, when we run this, we would expect that this is not going to execute because R doesn't exist, but red does exist, so we should be able to go and just echo that. So let me clear that, rerun, there we go. So we get the empty output here for R because why? This doesn't execute, why? Because this evaluated to false, whereas in this one, it evaluates to true here, and this dash V is just letting us do that. So we can just see, you know, if a specific key in the variable exists, that could be useful from time to time. And now let's go over, uh, yeah, listing all the variables here. So we can do echo uh, colors, and then we can just use the at symbol there, and done. So we can now run this, and we can see that we have all the values that are being listed here, which is pretty useful, right? You know, maybe you just want to see that. And, and by the way, you can actually, uh, nope, not that, nope, nope, that one. There we go. You can also list it just like this, which you will get the same output, but this is actually converting that array into one big string. So now we just have a single string with all that. You know, using the at symbol, technically the data structure is still an array, but you know, when using echo like this, like the output actually looks the same. So subtle difference there, but there is a difference there. Uh, but yeah, that could be useful if you just want to, let's say, maybe not loop over things, but you just want to see the values for everything. Uh, you can also do something very similar here to see all of the keys. So in this case, we can just put the exclamation point before the variable over here. And then that should give us our keys. And let me rerun this just so we can see here. Yeah, there we go. So we have blue, red, and green. Now, when you looked at this, it's an interesting situation, right? Uh, if, if you paid real close attention to how we define this, we actually define this in red, green, blue, like RGB. It's a pretty standard way to describe those three colors. However, we can see the output is not that. We are getting it back as blue, red, green. Now, this is deterministic. Like if I were to run this, you know, 100 times, we are going to get the same output for this input here, but we are not guaranteed the order that we put things in is not going to be what we see here that we get out. I don't know exactly implementation details of how this thing works. Uh, I, I'm not operating that low of level, but yeah, you just need to be really careful in that, uh, yeah, this needs to be ordered then you will need to do a much different solution. So I've got a blog post of this uh, version of this video coming up. I'm going to write this afterwards and maybe I'll, you know, research some things and link to that. But honestly, off the top of my head, like what I'm thinking here is, and by the way, the real world example, the ordering doesn't matter, but I don't know if you're getting to the point where you have some big complicated data structure, key values, and you know, maybe it's an object and not just a single value. And I would look to either use different command line tools to make it, you know, more manageable, or maybe in this case, like maybe using bash script isn't the case. Like maybe you should use Python or whatever other, you know, command line, uh, well, friendly command line language that you could use to script out whatever you need to do. So, you know, I really do like shell scripting and I write a lot of shell scripts from time to time, but, you know, I do jump to use Python quite a bit when things just starting to get, you know, get really, really dirty when it comes to using shell scripts or it just starts to get like overly complicated or I'm starting to wonder like, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> but um, yeah, sometimes honestly though, I, 
introducing third party like Unix tools, like, you know, not custom things that you would need to install, but, you know, just using like sed and grep and tr and other stuff, like sometimes that can make things a lot more manageable. So yeah, if you need ordering, maybe start looking for alternative solutions there. Yeah, maybe you can find something. Uh, yeah, let us know in the comments below because there is no really easy solution for that one, unfortunately, uh, using bash, like it's all like, you know, you got to do this thing and this crazy thing and the other thing. So yeah, at least that's what I found. Okay, so let's say that now we want to uh, loop over some of these values and, we, and in this case, we're just gonna print them out. But yeah, we can just use a for and loop. So we can say for color in, and then we actually want to loop over all of the keys here. So we're using the exclamation point there. And then we will do this and that. Okay, and then yeah, we need to do uh, when we're done. Man, so many different ways to do for loops, for loops in different languages or for in loops. And then let's go echo color. Cool. And that's going to give us our key because we're basically looping over all, over all of the keys. So we're basically for key in uh, colors there. And then we will, I don't know, just print the output of uh, the values. Now, in other languages, you could do something like, you know, for key comma value and then, you know, do something to uh, get that type of information. With Bash, I don't think there's a clean way to do that one. So what I ended up doing at the very least, you know, let me know if there's a better way to do, it, to do this one. Yeah, I just accessed it by keys similar to what we were doing, you know, in, in previous examples here. So for example, we could just say that uh, we've got colors. What do we want to do? Well, let's use the variable version of this one where we can just say for color. And so actually, this is a pretty reasonable use case of wanting to access something by a variable. And uh, yeah, there we go. So when we do this, this should give us all of our output here that we want to see. Yep, there we go. So there's blue, red, and green. And it did come out in the same order as before. But you know, now we're just looping over and printing it in a different way here. So there's the key and there's the value here. And this one is, you know, back to three characters because we set that over here when we updated it. I mean, there's more use cases, I suppose, that we could go over. But you know, this will get you going for, well, maybe like 90% of the cases, right? We, we know how to define stuff. We know how to delete specific values, update specific values, access things as variables, or just hard-coded strings. You know, we can see if uh, keys exist. And we can also list all the values, list all the keys, loop over all the key values. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a pretty good setup there. So yeah, let's go over a real world use case. And in my case, for some client work, setting up a Kubernetes cluster, and we have a whole bunch of different Helm charts that are installed. And I don't want to get into the gory gory details of that one. So let me just paste some code over here. And then we'll, you know, you can eyeball it and we'll kind of talk over it. So it's a little less uh, um, obscure, I guess, in case you've never used Helm before. But you can see we're using a lot of different patterns or the same patterns that we were just using before. So in this case, you know, we have a whole list of Helm repos. In my client's case, we had a lot more than two. I think there was like six or seven of them. But me, as a human being, I wanted a very quick way to check to see if any of these Helm charts could be updated. Like basically, are there newer versions available? And I didn't want to have to go and run all sorts of different like, you know, Helm search commands for each repo here. And uh, it's just, it would have been, well, it was annoying because I did it, you know, manually a couple of times. Like, when it comes to updating all six of them, like I would go to like, I don't know, like GitHub's release page and then look at those. Okay, did it change? No, go to the next one. Okay, do it that, like blah, 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 blah. And uh, then we can do a lot better than that. So now if I run this demo script, and by the way, I do have Helm installed. It doesn't matter if you do or don't, like you know, it's not super important here. But uh, yeah, we can see, nope, nope, don't want to kill that pain, thank you. So when I zoom in, uh, we can see the output here that actually says that, you know, See, um, both of these Helm charts were added and then I updated them and then we are searching them to see what's available. So we can see for sealed secrets like version 2.72 is out. And uh, in this case, using something like the AWS load balancer controller, you know, this is 1.47. So if you wanted to then go into uh, your Kubernetes config files and update things to be those versions, like you can go through the change log, you know, make sure there's no, you know, incompatible changes and things. And then you as, you know, responsible human would probably update things one at a time because, you know, production, you don't want to kind of do multiple things at once, or maybe you're pushing it to a pre prod environment. Anyways, it doesn't matter. But you can see where using these associative arrays were really helpful because, you know, we defined this uh, set of Helm repos here, then we just add them in the first loop, then we just update them like this is basically the way Helm works is it will, uh, you know, you can add a set of repos here. But uh, when you do a search, this is actually going to look through local files that are on your file system. And this update command is what allows you to get newer versions available from the internet. So, you know, it does this like local caching here for search. Anyways, like it just gives you basically the latest version of uh, the list of packages or Helm charts to install. So yeah, I mean, in, in my real case, I had these things wrapped up in little commands. So, you know, I really just run one command and it does the update and search in one shot. And this is kind of just a one-off and a different command, but you know, you get the idea here, right? This is one 
uh, concrete use case of maybe wanting to do this. And, you know, if associative arrays weren't used, there would be a lot more duplication here. But yeah, that's about it for this one. You know, let me know in the comments below some real world use cases that you've used associative arrays before, because I'm, you know, I'm imagining there's going to be hundreds of different use, use cases out there. But uh, with that said, yeah, if you have any questions about this, let me know in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer all of them. And thanks a lot for watching. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up and I will see you in the next one.